Hello everybody, and welcome back to my love-hate series where I pick out features of games that I either adore or despise. My videos of adoration will focus on the superb things a game deserves praise for, while my videos of contempt will come from a place of constructive criticism or downright disgust. Because while I may love many aspects of a game, there is always room for improvement. Now I know we love to critique and share content on our favorite games, so if you're looking for a new way to do that, check out the sponsor of today's video, Amino. Amino is a completely free mobile app full of as many communities as you can imagine, such as Dark Souls and Sekiro. Within this community, you can talk bosses, lore, share art, videos, memes, you name it. I even found some very interesting in-depth Maria fanfiction. You can even make your own stories to post. Moonlight? Butter. Huh. It doesn't fly. The Souls community has always been interconnected through shared experiences, so I encourage you to check out the app and join the Dark Souls community through the link in my description. Big thanks to Amino for sponsoring today's video, and thank you for listening. Back to the topic at hand, while today's video is going to be about the lackluster parts of Sekiro, keep in mind that it's intentionally weighted in that direction. There will be a corresponding video where I gush about everything it does beautifully. With all that said, let's get started with the 10 things I hate about Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Hate number one, grabs and no counter. It will probably come as no surprise with my penchant for aggression and dexterity builds in Souls that I'm a fan of the adrenaline-fueled combat in Sekiro, but that doesn't mean I'm ignorant to its flaws. Without question, its biggest weakness is how they handle grabs. There are three types of perilous, or unblockable, attacks. There are thrusts which can be deflected, dodged with flawless timing, or countered using the special Makiri move. Then we have sweeps which can be handled by strafing at right angles, running away, or jumping and doing an omega stomp on your opponent's head. Finally, you have grabs, which you can jump away from and pray not to get fucked by godly range, step away with what feels like frame-perfect timing, or get bent. My hatred here is twofold. For starters, the range, radius, and tracking on these grabs is far too precise. I do get why though. The combat was designed to limit your ability to dodge and force you to deflect. This works in nearly every other case because there's a viable counter, whether it be deflections, makiris, or goombas. But on the second fold, tracking is only such an issue because grabs are the only thing in the game that have no direct counter. It's baffling to me that each perilous attack is defined by being an unblockable attack that has a legitimate counter, but grabs are just dodge and hope for the best. The combat system would be in perfect balance if grabs had their own opposite match. To give an example, I'd love if they adapted the run and slide ability so you could use it mid-combat. Imagine if you could grab the arms of your opponent and use their momentum against them to slide under their crotch for a free booty smack. Now that's a strategy I could get behind. Give me this ability in the inevitable Tomoe DLC, FromSoft. Hate number two, Terror. Give me a Soulsborne Ekiro game without a status ailment that I despise and I'll give you the top 10 feet in Souls because by God it's what the people want. So the world might be mended. Souls has Curse, Bloodborne has Frenzy, and Sekiro has Terror. Let this ability stack and you're dead. That's it. It's an accompaniment to a lot of already irritating moves that adds the additional punishment of a terminal affliction. There are even mini bosses that are designed specifically around this mechanic, and let's just say that makes their fun factor plummet in otherwise interesting fights. In the case of Headless, I don't mind the slow effect, but I do mind that two blows means instant death with barely any time to use a pacifying agent. As for the Shichiman Warrior, he fires multiple spells in quick succession that can make terror a near instant buildup if you have a slight error in your movement. There are other examples of it in the game like the ape scream, but it never feels like anything more than a deterrent to keep you from being aggressive in a game that encourages it. That's more than frustrating enough to make me hate it, but it's the insta-kill nature of the punishment that seals it for me. I'm hard pressed to find any justification for instant death in a combat system that centers around a bend but try not to break posture mechanic. That makes it not only hateable, but sorely out of place. Hate number three, Dragon Rot. <coughs> this is a migraine. One of the alluring hooks for us masochistic Souls fans has always been that there is a punishment for death that adds a constant tension, but you have one chance to reclaim your lost resources. Well, Sekiro doesn't work quite the same, but my issue isn't that you lose half your send and XP to the next level as I'll address in the next video, no, it's that a random punishment upon multiple deaths is an ailment that spreads to NPCs. What's the penalty? You can't progress their quests for as long as they're ill. Oh, and the massive amount of guilt knowing that your exponential suckage spreads this plague further across the Ashina's land. 
man. I like the concept that your death has consequences to the world around you, especially in a game where your resurrection is such a central focus to the gameplay and story. But FromSoft did this already, and League's better at that. Demon Souls has a world tendency mechanic that makes the world harder to face when you die and easier to face as you slay demons. They even allow for you to opt out of the dark side of world tendency by keeping yourself in soul form at the penalty of playing at reduced HP. It wasn't explained the best in the game, but it had a wonderful balance of different mechanics at play that gave additional gravity to the world. Here, it's just pure punishment for deaths, and considering how difficult the game is, you're liable to contribute a lot to the rotting epidemic. As with World Tendency, there is a way to remedy the situation, but it comes in the form of an extremely rare item that you'd be hard-pressed to find all of in your first playthrough. Even if you do, there's only 16 of them, which makes you hesitant as to when you should expend each of these valuable resources. Frankly, it's nothing you should have to worry about. I would much rather they have done a better take on World Tendency. I have a suggestion for that too. Have Unseen Aid and another stat, call it Dragon Rot, Dragon Thought, I don't care, and start it at 0%. From there, each time you die, subtract a certain percentage from Unseen Aid and add it to Dragon Thought. Give that as an additional base damage upgrade to all the enemies in the game. Then each time you kill a large quantity of basic enemies, a mini boss, or a boss, give a percentage back to Unseen Aid and reduce the increased enemy attack power. I thought of this in the handful of moments it took me to write this section. It may have holes in it, and I'm sure it could be refined far more than I did here. My main point is that having your punishment for death being taken out on those around you, halting their quests, and forcing you to find rare droplets to cure it is tedious. It makes deaths far more grating than they need to be, and should either be improved or removed as far as I'm concerned. Hate number four, loads of useless consumables. Useless is relative, and while the vast majority of items you do pick up have some kind of use, the value that utility offers is minimal enough that picking up most items in the game serves more to clutter your inventory than to reward you. This has always been a problem in these games. There is a ton of bloat in what you pick up, and so much of it will never be used that it can be aggravating. It becomes even more apparent in Sekiro when you aren't picking up armor and weapons, so finding ceramic shard number 69 around the corner gets tiresome quickly. But of course, there are a handful of useful items, so you're encouraged to keep looting every shiny you find, only to be met with continuous disappointment at almost every turn. Certainly not the worst of complaints on today's list, but grating enough that it's worth a mention. Hate number five, non-refreshable spirit emblems. In this game, spirit emblems are effectively like mana in an RPG. Every time you rest, you get a replenished amount from your stores and have to manage their usage until you get another moment to rest. This adds a layer of strategy that I love. What I don't love is that it's a limited resource that becomes progressively more expensive to replenish with Sen over the course of the game. Sure, you get them from the world too, but it just doesn't feel quite right with them already being limited in quantity on your person at any time. I can compare this to blood vials in Bloodborne. If you go back to my love-hate video on that, I do say that I love the healing system, but chastise the need to farm them as a con, potentially turning away players. The same is true here to an extent. Though I like the strategy of limiting spirit emblems at a given time, it doesn't feel rewarding to run out of them and then have to go farm to get more. Spirit emblems may not be quite as key if you're comparing it to healing, but it's still noticeable, especially when your healing is replenished in this game, compared to Bloodborne where both of your primary resources need to be looted or purchased. Even if that decision is questionable, at least it's consistent with the design. Now I would argue that in Bloodborne it's because they want your resources to feel limited beyond simply moving from lamp to lamp to add a greater feeling of stress and despair, a design decision I agree with in that game. Because those items are very clear in what they want to accomplish. Blood vials heal 40% of your health, and blood bullets are your ammunition. In Sekiro, spirit emblems are tied to a number of different things including all of the prosthetics and different combat arts. I would love to experiment with everything, but I felt discouraged from doing so because I didn't want to have to farm for emblems. I don't want to blow it too far out of proportion because it isn't that bad to farm for Sen, especially in the end game, but it's still a decision that could have been alleviated entirely by making them replenishable upon rest. And in fairness to the Bloodborne comparison, Blood Bullets also fuel Hunter tools, though I find it far less ingrained in the overall playstyle compared to the prosthetic. In the end, I simply feel that it would have been more fun if I had felt less constrained by my emblem count when wanting to experiment with the different aspects of Sekiro's arsenal. And with an easy solution to this problem staring you in the face, it's hard not to feel a little bit of hate. Hate number six, inability to disable tutorial pop-ups. Keeping with the theme of less dramatic complaints that could improve the overall experience, this is about as simple as it gets. Why is there no option to disable the tutorial pop-ups? I actually quite like that they exist in the first place. The cryptic message system from Souls just wouldn't make sense here. They want you to know exactly how everything works from the get-go so that you aren't confused. That's fine with me because the game was plenty challenging even with the forced guidance. What I have a problem with is that there's no option to remove them for those who want to unless you're on PC 
and download a mod. Even worse, on subsequent playthroughs, you're forced to go through every single tooltip again. It becomes rapidly apparent how much these tips break the flow of gameplay early on, which is all the more noticeable when they aren't needed. This all could have been alleviated with a simple option to turn them off in the menus. Please patch this in, FromSoft. There is legitimately no reason for this not to exist in a modern game. Hate number seven, limited sound control. In line with both of those less grandiose complaints and minor but very fixable issues that can improve the overall experience, let's talk about the death blow sound effect. It's fucking loud. <laughs> I get it. It's meant to have a harsh weight to it. It gives the player a sense of immense gravity of a killing blow. And it does, because when you kill nearly everything in the game with one of these, holy shit do my ears get boomed! Again, simple fix. Add more in-depth customization for sound more than music, voice, and sound effects. Why not break down and list out multiple sound effects so you can mix the volume to your own desired standard? If you could turn down the sounds of a death blow, I probably wouldn't grow tired of it at all. Maybe for you, the frequent clashing of swords is grinding your gears. A simple slider allowing you to turn that down would be wonderful. To expand even further, maybe if you could control the difference in sounds between sword attacks that are blocked by your opponent and those that are deflected, players who are less of visual learners and more auditory learners could make the deflection sound louder to help them train with the game. These are just a few basic examples of how greater sound control can make for a more customized experience without great effort or sacrificing anyone else's ideal experience. Yet again from Soft, I want patches! Hate number 8, a regression in storytelling. Let me make my personal stance on FromSoft's modern storytelling very clear. I believe their ability to tell a story through NPC interactions, world building, epic encounters, and many treasures found throughout your journey is brilliant and adds a layer of mystery that is peeled back the more you invest, while still leaving enough room for interpretation that allows the community to speculate wildly for fun. It's very unlike the unapologetically forward storytelling of a game like God of War, for example. Sure, there are tidbits of lore to get in that game through the many aforementioned methods FromSoft uses, but you won't miss out on any major points because the meat of the narrative is driven by cutscenes and gameplay sequences that you can't miss. Another example is The Last of Us. In contrast to both Sekiro and God of War, almost the entire experience is presented directly to you. There are exceptions in collectibles that add small but worthwhile stories that make a decaying world feel more alive, but everything crucial will be experienced by anyone who plays the game. I make these comparisons to say that there's a varied meter between cinematic storytelling and storytelling through optional interaction with the world. The Soul series always erred heavily toward having its cinematic moments be interesting breadcrumbs that would encourage you to seek out answers from the world as to what it all means. Sekiro changes this by forcing a greater level of interaction through heavier cutscene dialogue and loads of mandatory NPC conversations. It's a subtle but noticeable measure that in my mind weakens the overall presentation. Let me make another comparison, in this case to Dark Souls. It's entirely possible to make it through that game learning minimal details about the story. You speak with Oscar in the Asylum and he tells you to escape in his stead and ring the bells of awakening to uncover your destiny. Even then, that conversation isn't mandatory. You could just kill him and skip it, which no one could blame you for with demons and hollows around every corner spooking you. Outside of that, if you ignore other NPCs, you can make it all the way to Anor Londo with no additional context. From there, you get told to kill the lords and fill the vessel so you can link the flame. Again, you have an opportunity to speak to NPCs, read item descriptions, etc. to learn more as to why, or you can just be a tool of death and silence Gwyn without really knowing anything. The vague delivery makes most players yearn for more knowledge about Lord Ran, and through that naturally encourages you to interact with the world more. In Sekiro, the basic premise is given to you on a platter. After the Ashina claim the land as their own, you join a great shinobi to become his apprentice. He trains you and puts you in the service of a lord that turns out to be special thanks to his heritage. His dragon blood is given to you, and this allows for immortality. The Ashina's position begins to weaken thanks to Ishin's illness at his old age, prompting enemy clans to swarm their land. As a last-ditch effort, Genichiro wants to use Sekiro's young lord to create an immortal army to save his land. But you stop him and save your lord, spending tons of time in forced dialogue with Kuro talking about how to sever immortality. You travel the lands gathering the necessary materials and get into conflict with your father after it turns out he wants to use the lord's blood too. Get him out of the way, claim the last materials, then you face off against Genichiro one last time that ends with a twist of taking on Prime Ishii. The core of this story is all presented directly to you, and it's not that the story is weak. I actually quite enjoy the story in this game. But since they decided to give you the meat of it for free, there is less motivation to explore the nuances that 
that are hidden behind sake-fueled NPC interactions. It felt like a half measure to make the story more digestible for a wider audience, which is a market that I belong to. Because admittedly, I heavily favor cinematic storytelling, but I also respect why these games work so much better without it. Of course, it isn't all black and white. As I mentioned, both God of War and The Last of Us, some of my favorite games of all time, use elements of indirect storytelling even with their primary delivery being through cutscenes, and it works really well there. You can certainly toe the line, but does Sekiro actually do a good job of that? Honestly, I think it's a much bigger topic that can be discussed in a single bullet point here. There are so many different things to dig into. Does the narrative deliver itself effectively? Are there too few notable NPCs outside of the core of Kuro, Emma, and Ishin? Are the characters like the sculptor underutilized? If you wanted to have straightforward storytelling, is it appropriate to name drop characters like Dogen, Tomoe, etc. in cutscenes without giving more context? Or are those the breadcrumbs that encourage you to seek out more? Are the triggers for NPC quests too vague for those who would seek it out? Am I reading far too hard at all of this? Truth is, I don't have a simple and clean answer. I can only tell you how I feel, and that is that even though my personal preference leans closer to pure cinematic storytelling, I enjoy the storytelling in Souls for sticking strongly to its style. And while Sekiro is a different project with its own goals, I think it gets muddled somewhere in between these different narrative methodologies that makes the experience feel less compelling than it could have been with a more clear vision. I don't know if I necessarily hate that, but I at least hate that I can't pin down how I feel about it all after multiple playthroughs. This is one that I'm excited to see all of you weigh in on. You've always been better lore buffs than me anyway. Hate number 9, Limited Boss Variety So since I'm not a lore guy, let's go back to my bread and butter, bosses. If you've seen my quality ranking, you can probably guess that I'm a big fan of Sekiro's bosses overall. With that said, I do have a slight problem with how many of them are reused over the course of the game. We've got Genichiro appearing three times, Ishin, Alfather, the headless ape and corrupting monk all appearing twice. If you count Genichiro only twice to ignore the intended tutorial loss, that still means that nearly 30% of the game's bosses are repeats. Now let's be clear, every single single one of these repeats brings something entirely new to the table. Ishin has fire versus thunder variants that differ dramatically despite similar first phases, Father Owl is an amplified version of the first with less shinobi tools, the headless ape is weaker but he brought backup, and the true corrupted monk has more health bars, different viable strategies, and a final phase that adds terror vomit. In a way, it reminds me of Devil May Cry 1 where the bosses were few but evolved over the course of the game. And that part I love, which we'll get into another time. My only issue is that with these evolutions taking precedent, the variety feels superficially limited because even though there are differences in their moveset, it still feels like a similar experience for better or worse. But I don't want to blame them because I enjoy the inclusion of nearly every twin I mentioned. It's more so that they could have included even more bosses to compensate. I can see why they didn't though, and that'd be thanks to the mini-bosses. Which brings me to today's final topic of hatred. Hate number 10, inconsistent mini-boss quality. Of all the things on this list that were a detriment to my experience, this has to be the top. Before even getting to the mini-bosses themselves, let's point out that if there's repetition in the bosses, it's even more rampant in the mini-bosses. Most of them have at least one copy, if not more. Sure, some of them mix things up a bit, but not enough to differentiate themselves in any innovative way. In fact, half the time it boils down to tossing a bunch of basic enemies in their arena, though I was thoroughly roasted in my mini-boss ranking for not noticing that some of these were clear opportunities opportunities to puppeteer. That's 100% on me, because I'm going to be totally honest and say that I forgot it existed. We all have our flaws, and one of mine is oversight in utilizing certain part of a character's build thanks to tunnel vision I get on aspects I enjoy the most. On that note, that points to exactly what my main problem is here. When it comes to something considered a boss, or in this case a mini boss, what I'm looking forward to is an opportunity to square up one on one in a focused combat encounter to see who comes out on top. Unfortunately for me, most mini bosses don't include fog, but are kind enough to be surrounded by hordes of basic enemies. Thanks to the cell system and ingenuity in using your shinobi tools, it is realistic to take them out handily without expending too much of your health if you do take the time. But therein lies the problem. The run up to some mini bosses that would normally be separated by fog is replaced by the level being the arena. This means if you die to a mini boss, you have to clear everything all over again. This is incredibly tedious, and it adds unnecessary pressure and stress to what should be a unique, exciting encounter, and makes me scratch my head as to why this is a thing when boss fog exists. Then I realized that their design decision here was intentionally to prevent it from always being one on one. Sometimes the purpose is to throw you into the gauntlet and see how you use your tools to make the best of it. Whether this works for you or not is subjective and based on which mini 
boss it is, but for me, I can't bring myself to enjoy bosses like the sword dude after Ogre who is surrounded by 10 basic bitches upon every death, or the other sword dude who's surrounded by a handful of gunmen. There are strategies to thin this herd, but they often involve dull range tactics that can be annoying to execute multiple times if you fail. I don't want to stifle creativity, and in fairness, these situations are one of the times that the game's lesser used tools get an opportunity to shine. But in my first playthrough, I was getting legitimately frustrated that there were so many mini bosses that felt like near copies of each other and broke the boss fog tradition that it made me worry the game wasn't going to have many true bosses. Fortunately, that worry was unfounded, but it doesn't erase them from the experience. And granted, I wouldn't want to get rid of the mini bosses. I like the challenge you undertake for the prayer beads, I just think those challenges could have been made much better on the whole. There are, of course, excellent encounters like the Armored Warrior, the Shichimin Warrior, the Wolverine that isn't surrounded by a billion mini me's, and the Ashina Elite. But then you've got gank heavy bosses like the Drunkards, the Wolverine that is surrounded by a bunch of mini me's, insert token sword guy here, and don't even get me started on headless slowing you down while giving you terror to the point of disembowelment. The thing is, these mini bosses didn't really polarize me in any great way on the whole, and as a result, I don't feel particularly compelled to talk about any of the boss's individual quality. Some are speed bumps that aren't too exciting, some are awesome duels that feel close to a full-fledged boss, and others miss the mark for their ganky, repetitive, and frustrating reasons that I've already mentioned. I love how they tie in progressing your stats with these challenges, but that doesn't mean the hit or miss quality of them is something that I don't hate. But of course, that's all just my opinion. What things about Sekiro do you despise? Let us know in the comments below. I've still got a video love letter to come for Sekiro, so be sure to subscribe for that and all the other videos I've got in the works. And if you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like. It means a lot to me to know you're enjoying the content. I want to thank you all for watching today. Much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.